Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Friday Forum this November 12th, 2021. I'm Derek Anderson with the CUPS PhD student group here at UIC. And we are happy to welcome uh, the team from Harvard's Growth Lab, uh, Frank Nefke and Annie White. Uh, launched in 2021, uh, just this past June, Harvard's uh, Growth Lab at the Center for International Development uh, launched the tool Metroverse. It's an online platform that delivers new insights on economic development questions uh, for about a thousand cities globally, delivering unprecedented coverage and analysis of cities among their global and regional peers. Joining us today is Frank Nefke and Annie White. Uh, Frank Nefke is the research director at Harvard Growth Lab. His research is focused on economic transformation and growth from the macro level of structural change in regional and national economies to the micro level of firm diversification and career paths of individuals. Uh, he holds a PhD in economic geography from Utrecht University. And Annie White, the senior software product manager at Harvard's Growth Lab. Uh, with over 12 years of experience in sustainable development research software products, uh, Annie White is interested in how the digital products can help solve global development challenges. At the Growth Lab, she is responsible for the development of the International Atlas of Economic Complexity. And he has a master's degree in development economics from the University of Glasgow. Uh, please welcome our guests. And uh, Frank, uh, you should be a co-host so you can begin now if you want. Uh, great. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for having us. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure that, uh, um, to be able to talk about this tool that uh, I, I have to give most credit to Annie uh, and her team to, for building the tool. Um, uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, why the tool exists and where it comes from, because uh, uh, Metroverse is not just a way to visualize uh, an economy, uh, a city's economy. But it's uh, it's trying to do that in a way that um, summarizes and leverages um, over ten years of re uh, research into how economies actually transform and diversify. Um, so we have not that much time, so, uh, and I'll try to keep it somewhat focused. Uh, if you have any questions, please just interrupt, and uh, I'm happy to to expand a bit. Um, but let's make sure we have some time to also show the tool so that uh, we can give you a very quick demo as well. Um, <clears throat> so let me share my screen. Um, yes, let's see. This should be full screen now, right? There Good. we go, yep. Great, thank you. Uh, so I should also say that I'm actually uh, uh, the outgoing research director at the Growth Lab. I'm currently um, starting a group on the science of cities uh, at the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna. So I'm, uh, I'm talking to you from Vienna, Austria. Um, so the, the Growth Lab has studied economic growth. Um, and one of the uh, things about economic growth is um, that uh, it has been very rapid. Um, we don't really understand very well why it has been so rapid for, uh, for the past uh, 200, 300 years or so. Uh, our typical way of uh, looking at economic growth is uh, economic production is that you have a production function like, like this. You have GDP um, on the left, and uh, that is then uh, uh, you, you have a homogeneous mass of capital that you uh, combine with a homogeneous mass of labor. And then you add something to it, which is the unknown part. It's a technology uh, that uh, makes some economies more productive than others. Uh, and the output is then some homogeneous mass of, of, of let's say, GDP. But if you think of how you, uh, economic production really works, how do you make a car, uh, for instance, it's actually very different, right? So if you, if you want to make a car, um, you need a blueprint. Uh, you will need specific, uh, specialized machines. 
You need people who know how to operate those machines. You need infrastructure to get the cars to the customer and to get the raw materials to the, to the car plants. Uh, you might use some help from um, technology institutes. Uh, so this is a, uh, a German institute uh, that uh, supports the automotive uh, industry in Germany with research. Uh, and you may need some uh, institutions. So this is a, a by now quite old article in, uh, in the Atlantic that asks uh, the question about the liability uh, of uh, uh, in situations where uh, a self-driving car uh, gets into an accident. So that's an institution that we have to figure out. Otherwise, these things cannot really uh, uh, be deployed on, uh, on the roads. So to build a car, you need uh, a whole lot of different things. And instead of thinking about uh, economic production as being a com com uh, trying to combine capital labor with some technology, uh, we actually think of it as uh, uh, combining a whole lot of different types of capital goods and a whole lot of different types of labor. So people with different skills. Uh, uh, and in that sense, um, you can think of this as playing a game of Scrabble. So in the game of Scrabble, um, if you want to produce any uh, product, uh, if you want to uh, write any word, you will need all of the letters that that word has. So just uh, like in economy, if you want to be able to produce a product, you will uh, have to have all of the inputs, all of the capabilities that that product requires. Um, so this uh, idea that an economy um, actually leverages uh, a large number of somewhat latent capabilities uh, to produce the output that, output that it does uh, has been developed in a number of papers um, that came out in the, over the last uh, 10, 15 years um, that are listed here with the main one is actually the one in science in uh, 2007 by Cesar Hidalgo and Ricardo Hausmann um, who are here on the left. So if you think of this, um, this growth, which we actually call economic, uh, an economic complexity view on, on growth, um, there are two central assumptions behind that view. Uh, first, there is not just two inputs, but there are many different input factors. Uh, and there are very strong complementarities between these input factors. So um, it's, uh, that means that they are not very substitutable. That's the main assumption. So think of it uh, like this. If you need a car engineer, you cannot easily um, hire any number of accountants as substitutes. So if you need a car engineer, you will have to hire a car engineer. Um, and this is also true for all of the other inputs. They, they complement one another, but they're not really substitutes. So if you think of this in an abstract way, it actually can be thought of as a network. Uh, so it's a, a, a network with capabilities in the middle and uh, countries or economies uh, on the left. Uh, so these countries, they connect to the capabilities they have. Uh, and on the right, you have the products that connect to the capabilities they require. So the network connects countries to the capabilities um, to products. Now, this network is actually not the network that you can see in real world data. Instead, what you can see is the kind of products that countries make. So you can see the network that connect a country to all of the products it exports, for instance. But what you would like to have is a network that tells you how, can, how different products are connecting uh, to each other in terms of the capabilities that they require. So you would like a network that tells you uh, which products are similar in, in their capability requirements. Now, the insight in, uh, that is leveraged in these papers on economic complexity is that you can actually infer something about capabilities from trade patterns. Um, so the, uh, uh, the main idea is that if it's true that to export a product, countries will need all of the capabilities that the product requires, uh, then if these, cap uh, these capabilities are expensive to acquire and maintain, then it makes sense that countries will try to economize on their capabilities and therefore use them as well as they can. And therefore, you would expect that uh, uh, if products are very often co-exported by the same countries, that's likely a sign that they have similar capability requirements. So that's the logic that is being leveraged in these papers, uh, which um, in the early versions all uh, happened at the uh, international trade uh, level, so at the level of countries and their economies. And the 
the main thing that came out of this literature was this, uh, uh, this idea that there's something like a product space, which is depicted here, where each, pro uh, where each dot, each node of this network is a product. And these uh, nodes are connected if the products require similar capabilities, which is inferred from the fact that these products are very often co-exported by the same countries. So if you see that many countries that make cars also make motorcycles, then you would infer from that that cars and motorcycles are similar. The calculations are, are uh, uh, somewhat more involved because they compare everything to a statistical benchmark, but that's the main principle that, that is being used. Now, it turns out that this product space uh, is actually very predictive of how economies diversify. So if you imagine that you're a country and uh, there is a specific uh, product that you don't have, then you look at uh, that you're not exporting yet, uh, then you look at how related that product is to all of the products that you are already exporting. And that's this number that's here, phi, we call that density of a, of a product, um, the, or the technological fit. That's a way to, to, to think about it. So that's how close is a product to uh, an economy. And on the vertical axis, you see the likelihood that that product will be exported by that country within the next five years. And you see that there's a very strong relation between uh, how close a product is to all the other products in the economy in terms of this product space network uh, and the likelihood that uh, there will be a diversification move in that direction. So this is the, the, the work that happened at the international level. Uh, and that's also the resolution where a lot of our early research was. So looking at how countries uh, grow and diversify. But uh, if you think of it, the real resolution of economic activity is actually much finer than, uh, than just uh, the level of country. So if you, um, if you look um, at um, where capabilities actually reside in an economy, um, they are not available throughout the entire country. So for instance, if you want to make cars, uh, there are a lot of the capabilities that you will require are available in Detroit, but not necessarily just in any random place in the US. So in that sense, you could say that, yes, the US is a car making country, but, uh, uh, but it's actually Detroit that has the capabilities to do so. Um, and in the literature, uh, uh, this has actually been replicated. So this is a paper I did uh, quite a while ago that, where um, I uh, looked at whether also regions diversify into products, into industries that are related to what they were already doing. Um, but it's not just industries that, uh, so you find the same relationship, uh, but it's not just industries. So other people have looked at, um, at technology. So this is a paper by Ron Bosma uh, and his co-authors. Um, so they look at patenting in cities. And again, they calculate how related different technology classes are. And then they uh, calculate the likelihood that a certain um, uh, technology will emerge in a city and they predict that emergence from how many related uh, technologies the city already has uh, uh, in, its, uh, uh, in its current technology basket. Um, <clears throat> so this has been uh, this, this finding that uh, cities diversify into related uh, activities has been replicated in a large number of contexts. So at the international level, people have looked at this uh, in Industries and regions, uh, not only my own work, also uh, Mercedes Delgado with, uh, with Michael Porter and Scott Stern have a paper that uh, pretty much replicates the same. And there are a bunch of other papers, uh, Eslitz Pichler and, uh, and Zhu in, uh, in China as well. Uh, innovation in cities, the paper that I just mentioned, mentioned, also science fields. So what kind of things are the universities of, of a uh, of a city good at. Uh, also, that is predictable from these uh, kind of networks. Uh, and it's so, um, uh, it's so prevalent that people have started referring to this as the principle of relatedness. Uh, so that's the paper uh, of uh, Cesare Dalgo in 2018 that uh, gives an overview of this literature if you're, if you're interested. Now, um, if you try to study uh, economic transformation, it's actually very challenging because uh, structural transformation is a slow process. And the time series over which we can, um, we can observe uh, uh, such, uh, such processes is much shorter uh, because our data sets are typically limited by, um, 
uh, in time to like 20, 30 years, and then there are all kinds of um, classification breaks which make it hard to study that. Um, if you instead want to look at it cross-sectionally, so look at development differences uh, between cities, you are limited to the cities inside the country, which is only a very small uh, part of the variation of the development of cities. So you can easily do a study for how uh, um, US cities um, um, develop compared to other US cities, but it's very hard to compare a US city to a Chinese city. Uh, and those are maybe the more interesting, it's more, maybe the more interesting variation to look at. Um, so the data requirements are very heavy. You need long time periods if you want to do the longitudinal um, uh, kind of analysis, um, or uh, you need global coverage if you want to do something beyond uh, a city, uh, beyond a, a particular country. Uh, on top of that, you need very detailed information on capability. So you need micro data. You need to know where these activities are, who's active in them, how people move in the economy, uh, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and you need detailed uh, uh, geographical uh, and geocoding. Um, so we, we try to tackle this in, uh, in two ways. Uh, so one is that we looked at the long-term transformation of the US economy. I'll just show you some pictures because this is not what this talk is about, but that's one way to deal with it. Just look in the long-term, how do economies transform? Uh, and for that, we, uh, we actually uh, build a data set that merges uh, the full count US census information with uh, all inventors in the USPTO, the US uh, uh, Patent and Trademark uh, Office. Um, between uh, 1850 and 1940, we have this match and the patents are of course somewhat long. Uh, if you use these data, you can actually very nicely see how the US uh, changes. So this is uh, US population 1850, and you basically see how um, uh, more and more cities are added and uh, how uh, the urban structure actually expands westward. So this is uh, in each of these, uh, this is actually based on micro data. So these are individual level data behind this. So you can see each person and the occupation, the industry that they're in, the kind of uh, patterns they hold and so on. Um, but for this, for today's talk, uh, we actually tried uh, the other way to uh, deal with uh, the data um, uh, limitations, namely to try to build a global data set <clears throat> that allows us to look at compare cities across the world. So we went to uh, the Dun & Bradstreet uh, wall base, which is a large scale um, uh, company registry uh, data set uh, that basically um, uh, has information on I think it's somewhere like 170 to 200 million establishments, uh, the kind of industries that they're active in, up to six different industries per establishment, and also the ownership relations. So who owns which establishment, which of the other establishments own which, which establishments in, the, uh, in this data set, plus a very detailed uh, geocoding. Um, so there are, um, I should say that most of the, of the of the heavy lifting here was done by Yang Li, who's also in the audience. So if you have any specific questions on the on the data, uh, Yang will be be able to give you a, a, a very extensive answer. Uh, but for us, what was important was that uh, we would have information on consistent industry codes. So across the world, we uh, we have uh, industries classified in the NIC system. Uh, uh, all plants are geocoded. We have an estimate of how many employees there are uh, per plant. Um, also something on total sales, but that's not fully reliable. And we know who owns each, uh, each establishment. So if you use these data, you can actually look at the economy of Detroit. Uh, and that would look like, like this, where uh, each dot now is not just telling us how much economic activity uh, there is, but actually what type of industries we can find uh, in each of these uh, dots in this, in this map. And once you have the data like this, you can slice them in any way you want. For instance, you can look at counties or uh, you can look at functional areas, or you might uh, look at what we call the urban core, uh, which is a, a city definition that is used in Metroverse. Uh, and that's uh, based on uh, satellite data where, where uh, the goal was to find contiguous uh, parts in space that are populated. So where there's population density and the uh, and the build environment. So as you can see, uh, this the nice thing about this definition is that it doesn't really care about um, 
any uh, um, uh, administrative boundary. So Detroit um, has part of its capabilities located just across the border in, uh, in Canada, uh, where actually some of the car manufacturing plants uh, are, are located. Um, so uh, this particular definition is useful for Metroverse because uh, it allows us to have city definitions that are harmonized across the world. You might wonder how representative these data are. And uh, they, uh, to be uh, completely transparent, they are not fully representative. They're not perfect data. There are many uh, missing data. Uh, so we try to get a sense of how how well uh, how much we can how much trust we can put into these data, and we did that by comparing um, uh, the economic data we got from uh, the Dun and Bradstreet World Base to the world population grid to get an idea of the spatial distribution of economic activity to nightlight data um, by industry to to see whether not just the spatial distribution of economic activity is more or less accurate but also the industrial breakdown, breakdown we uh, used for manufacturing the UNIDO data, which gives you manufacturing sectors at a very detailed level across the world, uh, and ILO data for somewhat broader sectors that would also include services. And where possible, we actually did not just look at whether uh, the spatial distribution and industrial, uh, uh, the sectoral breakdown of the data uh, was uh, representative, but rather whether the intersection was representative. So we used Eurostat and Orbis, OECD, and uh, and some uh, um, some international censuses. So we get near perfect results for the US, which is uh, very nice, um, uh, and good results for 38 countries in total. Um, but it was not just good results for 38 countries; also outside these countries, for many of the larger cities, there seemed to be sufficient. Uh, uh, data available. So what we use is uh, we use a selection of these cities where we think that the data are good enough um, to, uh, to do some analysis. Now the second thing that we want to know is how do cities actually, what kind of trans uh, transformation potential is there for each city? Uh, and for that we needed to figure out which cities are related. Uh, and we did that by trying to create something like a product space uh, but now not just for traded products, but actually for the entire economy, including services and, uh, um, and all the things that are actually not exported. Um, so there are many ways in which you can create industry spaces. Um, and uh, basically you can, the idea is that you once again leverage that the economy knows what is related. So if you see that two firms, that a firm um, combines certain activities in the same establishment, it's likely that it does so because there are economies of scope between these, uh, uh, these activities. At the same time, when firms own establishments in different industries, that's because of economies of scope. If a region uh, thinks that co-located in a region is like with the product space before, it's likely that they are uh, related. So what we did is in Metroverse, uh, we basically went to a firm uh, and went to one of the establishments of that firm, and we asked which activities are uh, do you find in this uh, particular establishment? So in this establishment, for instance, you find uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, and uh, and uh, healthcare activities. Now that suggests that these things might be related, but we actually uh, repeated this process across the economy so that we had. Uh, tens of millions of these portfolios. Um, and what we uh, then uh, did was we used a, um, a dimensionality reduction uh, algorithm. We used UMAP here, um, which tries to, uh, fig to place industries that are... Um, uh, very often found in the same establishments, very close to each other, with the interpretation that these industries will be very related to one another. So uh, you might end up with something uh, where a toy example looks like this, where you have a bunch of industries that are now positioned in, a, in an abstract space that tells you uh, that nearby things are related and far away things are unrelated. So if you do that with the real data, you get something that looks like this where um, you have all kinds of uh, different uh, dots here, where each dot is an industry, and the colors are large uh, sectors. 
So we divided this map in, um, or in small, what we call technology or knowledge clusters um, that group industries that uh, are very closely clustered together. If you look at this map, it actually has a very interesting structure. Um, so the manufacturing sector, for instance, is spread out from the bottom left where you have food processing industries very close to agriculture. Uh, you have uh, industries that rely heavily on uh, raw materials like wood and textiles. Uh, then you get to chemicals and stone over here, very close to mi uh, mining. Uh, slowly you move into metal and then here starts machinery with here vehicles, so car industries so somewhere here. Um, if you go further uh, to the right, you end up in more high-tech activity, like electronics and uh, ultimately in optical instruments and pharmaceuticals. Now, if you go further down, you actually transition into the services. So from pharmaceuticals, you move, uh, you get to healthcare, uh, which makes a lot of sense that these things are close to one another. Uh, then from healthcare, you end up in government, administrative services, finance, business services, and then you get more into the uh, consumer facing uh, activities like entertainment, restaurants and food stores, where you basically full circle again, very close to food manufacturing. So this structure actually came out of the data. It's not something that we put in there. This was just uh, the result of analyzing these uh, tens of millions of uh, 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 establishment uh, establishment level economic portfolios. Now, um, as I showed you before, um, these spaces tend to be indicative of where an economy can move. So economies will not move far in this space typically. So that suggests that you can use these spaces to uh, analyze cities and to draw what is the what we what you can call the adjacent possible. So what we did is we uh, we essentially calculated a location quotient um, and plot that location quotient on the map. So for each industries we calculate the location quotient in uh, New York City, where I should say it's not really location quotient, but because you can. You do not necessarily compare to the world, but to a benchmark that you can choose yourself. Uh, so uh, each node here expresses uh, how much larger this industry is in the city than you, uh, that you're looking at compared to uh, uh, um, a basket of benchmarks. So you see that New York City is actually um, heavily concentrated on finance and services. Uh, and you can compare it to Chicago, uh, which uh, um, uh, to some extent, is, uh, is similar to the, uh, a similarly large uh, uh, city in the, in the US, but has uh, quite a different economic structure. So you see that whereas New York is almost completely focused on its service sector uh, and then mainly business services and finance, you see that uh, Chicago has uh, a lot of remnants in uh, manufacturing. Uh, so especially in the machinery manufacturing over here and, uh, uh, and some food manufacturing with uh, uh, somewhat less in terms of uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and optics. Um, so this allows you to very quickly get a sense of how do New York City and Chicago differ from one another in terms of the capability, uh, uh, the capabilities that they might have. Um, but the nice thing about the data and the reason why we actually went there is that you do not have to limit yourself to a comparison uh, within the US. So you can also compare these cities to Shenzhen and uh, Hong Kong. Uh, where um, these cities are actually just 30, 40 kilometers apart. Um, and you see that Hong Kong is, a, is completely service oriented, whereas Shenzhen is, of course, the manufacturing uh, city of the world, where uh, you see a, a very heavy manufacturing focus. Now, uh, research that we did beforehand suggests that cities diversify um, at a close distance in this space. So you can try to quantify that distance, um, which in these papers uh, basically is taking a weighted average of the size of an industry in the city where the weights are the proximity of the industry to your focal industry. So let's say I want to know the density of car making in Detroit. Then I look at all other products and I look at how far are these pro products uh, or how close are these products to car making in the industry space? 
And then I look at how big are these other products. This should be a J, by the way, uh, over here. So you could say here we say big is if the location quotient is larger than one. You could also use employment here or the log of employment, whatever you uh, you like. Uh, but it gives you a sense of how large is the uh, related activity. Um, now, one thing that we do in Metroverse, because we have used this a lot in uh, applied work, is to plot all industries um, uh, for a city in this two by two matrix, where on the horizontal axis, you have uh, something that expresses how large the industry is in the city. So it's basically uh, a location quotient with where the uh, denominator uh, is provided by uh, the benchmark cities. So if you are to the right of zero here, it means that the industry is bigger in your city than in the benchmark cities. And to the left, it means that it's smaller. On the vertical axis, you get the technological fit. So this density. So that is basically asking, does the industry fit your city better than it's positive? Uh, or does it fit your benchmark city better? And then it's negative. Now, in the data, you typically see that most of uh, the industries locate somewhere around this 45 degree line, uh, which makes sense because you have up here, you have industries that are large in the city, but they also fit the uh, city very well. And in the bottom, you have industries that are small in the city, but they also fit uh, the city very well. What is more interesting uh, from the point of view of economic policy is the other quadrants, namely um, uh, the upper left, uh, which, we, uh, which we called opportunity, but we put it in quotes uh, because it's not really necessarily an opportunity. Uh, that is where uh, the, um, the industry is relatively small, uh, but it would fit the city very well. So these are industries that you would expect to be much larger in that city, given their technological fit. Uh, and therefore, you could predict that that will be, grow be a, 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 an industry that grows in future, and often it does. Uh, so that's why we call it an opportunity. But you might also ask yourself, why, if this industry fits this city so well, why didn't emerge? Uh, why didn't they grow yet? Why, why is it still so small? Uh, and that's why I also like to think of these industries that are in this opportunity quadrants quadrant as uh, anomalies that you would like to uh, look at more closely. So you can, uh, you can ask yourself, so what is holding this industry back? And that might actually help you identify some uh, constraints that are binding the growth of that industry that might also limit the growth of other industries. So it might be a very good place to start looking for what kind of uh, problems uh, you might try to resolve in the economy. Uh, in the bottom right, you have the opposite. It's industries that are far too large, given for uh, how well they fit. So here you might think that they will shrink, which, which could happen. But you could also think of other reasons why they are in this quadrant. For, for instance, they are so new that they don't have an ecosystem around them yet. So they might still grow if they manage to build this ecosystem. Uh, or they are there for completely different reasons. Um, so in the Netherlands, where I'm from, uh, there's a city called Utrecht, where all the trains come together. And that's why there is a very large uh, um, uh, industry that uh, maintains uh, railway stock. Uh, otherwise, the city is uh, the highest uh, educated city in the, in the Netherlands. There's very uh, rather uh, little of this kind of uh, lower skilled work. But there's a good reason why that industry is located in this place. Um, and once you know that, you might actually try to leverage that. And you might see if you can use it in other ways, uh, provide more uh, jobs that are related to this industry because you know it. it's actually very well anchored in this. Um, so I think here, um, I would like to hand off to uh, Annie to give you a quick feel for how we try to make this available to the world, this kind of analysis, uh, and then uh, happy to take any questions. Perfect. Thank you, Frank. Um, I will begin a demo of Metroverse. And as I understand, um, a number of you have already seen the tool. Um, so I'm actually going to keep this demo um, intentionally short because I want there to be time to um, uh, uh, answer your questions about the tool. OK, so what I'm going to do now is orient you in Metroverse, um, show you some of the things 
Frank has explained in action and in the tool. And then um, hopefully we'll have some time to uh, take your questions, whether that's about the methodologies, navigating the tool itself, whatever it might be. Okay, so if you haven't seen Metroverse already, the link is in chat. This is what it looks like when you come to the tool. Um, we build just about all of our tools at the Growth Lab to be public goods. So um, anyone can use Metroverse um, as long as you have an internet connection. So you can tell um, the sort of nature of the coverage in the tool by looking at this map on our landing page. You can pan in um, to zoom in and out depending on the region that you're interested in. And you'll see right away that um, the tool has global coverage. Which is which is quite unique, um, but it doesn't have equal or perfect coverage. And so, one of the goals on on our team at the Growth Lab is to expand our coverage over time, um, and that's largely related to data quality um, in countries and cities. So, I'll carry Frank's um, example forward with the city of Detroit. So, I just take my drop down menu here, um, and I will choose. Detroit, Michigan as the city I'm going to show you today. So of course, right away, we can see the city boundary um, for Detroit. This is that urban core that Frank was talking about. Um, one of the features we're, we're currently thinking through right now is the ability to choose one of two to three different kinds of city boundaries, depending on the, the region or aggregation that you're interested in. For now, we'll go with what we have and we will review the city. So when you come into our tools, um, for those of you familiar with the Atlas of Economic Complexity, you'll see some familiar themes here, not just the logic used in the tool, but some of the visual cues as well. We put data visualization front and center in our tools. Um, so what you're looking at right here is the economic composition of the city of Detroit in 2020 um, by its total employee count and then colored by nine different sectors. Um, just about everything in here you can play around with and customize. So I might come in here and say it's not the entire economy of Detroit I'm interested in. It's only leisure and hospitality. I might come in here and say I want the whole economy, just not finance, take it out. So you can always play around with this stuff. Um, what I'll draw your attention to is this five part narrative that we have on the left hand side of the screen, and this is intended to kind of take you through the story of Detroit, whatever city that you choose. Um, and as our research um, grows around cities and as we're able to answer more questions, you'll see this navigation grow. But for now, this is what we think the research can answer um, in this tool. There was about a thousand cities in here. And the reason why we think that uh, the coverage is so important is because we wanted to have the ability in this tool to compare. Um, it's one of the superpowers of Metroverse that you can start to compare cities to each other and not just cities that are nearby you, um, sort of your regional counterparts, you can compare any city to any other city in the tool. So if I'm interested in comparing Detroit to a city, I would simply come up here and say, let's add a comparison. And we give you some options here. So we say you can compare your city with a basket of cities that we've pre-populated. So global peers that have a similar population, that have a similar economic structure. Maybe it really is cities in your region that you're interested in, or you can choose a single city to compare it to. So we often like to show this example of Detroit compared to Ulsan, South Korea. Ulsan, South Korea has the largest auto manufacturing plant in the world. Um, and you can see that start to come through here in this manufacturing side-by-side -side comparison. So here we have Detroit Industries on the left, Ulsan, South Korea on the right. Detroit is often called the Motor City because its economy is so heavily concentrated in um, uh, transportation manufacturing. But one of the amazing things about comparing cities internationally is you can start to contextualize um, these, these uh, makeups that a city has. When you do that in the case of Detroit versus Ulsan, you can see actually Ulsan has uh, a transportation manufacturing industry that's uh, double the size of Detroit. So for investors around the world, economic promotion agencies, these types of comparisons can be really, really inter interesting. Um, I'll come back. And by the way, you can, you can drill down all the way down to the six digit level here. 
okay, to get a, a real granular sense of, of what we're talking about. And you can come back up to the sector level. Okay, so I'll remove the comparison, I'll come back. By the way, we always like to give people lots of options for customizing, customizing their visualization. So here you'll always see viz options. You can open that up. You can change um, uh, the way that the tree map has been calculated, whether that's by count of employees or count of establishments, it does change slightly. Um, you can go down to the six digit level of granularity all the way up to one. There, of course, you really see that motor city concentration in Detroit. Um, this tree map by default um, is colored by industry groups, which I showed you down here. You can also color it by years of education. So here we're seeing the breakdown of Detroit's economy by industries that are high, that require high education, purple, and low education in green, or by hourly wage, high hourly wage in red, and low in blue. Okay, so you can always come in here, play around. If you get lost, you can hit default settings and it takes you right back to where you started. Um, we know that most cities do a lot of the same things, right? So no matter what city you look at here in Metroverse, you're always gonna find something related to education, um, lots to do with professional and business services, financial activities, and so on. What we wanted to tease out in this tool is this idea that just because you're doing something in your city doesn't mean that you necessarily specialize in it or sort of have this outsized concentration of activity in a particular industry and that's a really important piece to know about a city because it starts to let us know where knowledge or where know-how is clustering in a city and so if i go from economic composition to what does my city specialize in i'll choose a benchmark here by the way um one of the central components of metroverse is this idea that you have that you choose a benchmark okay so when we say what does my city specialize in well the very next question is compared to what um, and so we put that control into the hands of of you all and say well you get to pick your benchmark and the results will change ever so slightly so i'm going to say well what does detroit specialize in compared to cities that have a similar economic structure as that city itself and what you will see here is really not a surprise. It's a little bit more of what we saw in the tree map. So it's specializing in transportation equipment manufacturing, machining, machinery manufacturing, and so on. If I scroll all the way down, I can see these are the industries where Detroit has sort of has that smaller relative presence. Okay, so relative to its global peers with a similar economic structure, there's not a lot of water transportation, leather, textile mills, and so on. Um, I can bump this up to a bit of a higher level of aggregation, right? So not exactly a lot of natural resources happening in Detroit, okay? Um, but here's manufacturing all the way at the top with the highest relative presence. Just by sake of comparison, if I show you Boston, it's quite a different picture for Boston. So here's manufacturing for Boston. It has a low relative presence compared to its global peers with a similar economic structure, but a lot more happening in healthcare and education. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip down to the industry space. So Frank was showing us this in his presentation. In Metroverse, it's a, it's a completely interactive data visualization. So it's a super unique data visualization. Let me just go back to Detroit back up here. Um, and you're going to see kind of a bird's eye view of Detroit's economy. And here are those knowledge clusters throughout this data viz. So some people, when they look at this, they think it's a geographical map of a city. It's not. The industry space looks exactly the same. It's shaped exactly the same, no matter what city you're looking at. But what makes every city unique it's, is where its knowledge is clustering. And sure enough, for Detroit, we see a lot happening up here in manufacturing, but actually some happening down here in finance and services. This is sort of the highest level of aggregation for knowledge clusters. There's a layer underneath these seven knowledge clusters and if you click on here, you can start to get at that. Okay, you can click down in the industry space all the way down to a single industry. So if I look here and I say, okay, um, the colored circles that I see or the colored nodes are industries where Detroit sort of has a presence in that in industry. If I click on this, what this will start to tell me is what's nearby to that industry I already have a presence in, but that I'm not really doing in my city. And those are the gray circles here. 
So what's amazing about the industry space is not only does it sort of have this bird's eye view of an economy, it starts to indicate to me where nearby diversification option uh, uh, opportunities can happen in my city. Okay, um, if I come into viz options, there's a cool way to look at the industry space. So right now we're seeing it with all those knowledge clusters outlined. If I add a shading overlay, it really draws your eye to where that presence is in a city. So high relative presence is the darkest shade of blue, low is the lightest. So right away for, for um, Detroit, it goes up to manufacturing. If I look at a city like um, New York, for example, you'll see it go all the way down here into finance. And so let's see what this is. HR, finance, accounting, um, some event related services and so on. Okay. So we come from the industry space and we say, okay, I'm starting to get a sense not only of my city's economic composition, uh, not only where I kind of have an outsized presence in certain industries, but also what the opportunities are available to me next. So here's that, um, that matrix that Frank was showing us. Again, I'm gonna go back to Detroit here and show you for Detroit what's really interesting is that if we look to its opportunity quadrant up here, there's actually a lot of diversification. Um, you can just tell by looking at it just by color. Um, so every single one of these nodes here is a single industry. And these kind of represent the industries where Detroit currently has a smaller presence, but we think they have the technological ecosystem for that industry to grow and thrive. Um, so yes, of course, there is some manufacturing in here. If I just keep manufacturing, you'll see that. And that's because there's a lot of manufacturing and uh, know-how already in Detroit. But the amazing thing is that there's not just manufacturing as an opportunity. If I take away manufacturing here, I can see that there's um, lots going on in hospitals. Um, I think there's schools in here as well. This is specialty hospitals, um, some happening in software, a little bit in finance as well. So that diversification uh, picture for Detroit starts to kind of emerge here. And then you can always look at this as a table as well um, and filter, for example, if I wanna know just the opportunities in Detroit, here they are. Um, I can sort just by technological fit scores, relative presence scores, and so on. Okay, the last thing I'll show you really quick and then we can go to questions is similar cities. So um, when we built Metroverse, we built it with a group of 15 pilot users. And these pilot users are um, senior level city officials from all over the world. And we learned really, really quickly from this group that um, uh, comparing your city to another city, whether that's nearby or far away, is one of the most common analytical frameworks um, city leaders uh, sort of assume. And so we wanted to make sure that we could um, provide some information there. So when you come to similar cities, what we're looking at here is, is a little bit different than, for example, um, similarity based on population or size or um, economy. What we're looking at is um, are two cities similar, two cities are similar if they have the same, um, if they're competitive in the same industries, or they have sort of the same productive capabilities. Okay, so Detroit's interesting because you see these 10 cities in the most similar um, ring, and then a little bit lower similarity here. Um, I can look at this as a geographical map. If I zoom out, indeed, you'll see some of the most similar cities for Detroit are in fact in the United States, but there's some internationally as well. Orange is sort of that next step down in terms of similarity, and a lot of those for Detroit are actually in Europe. Um, so this, again, is an amazing way for policymakers in a city to say, I want to know who has the same strengths, the same challenges, the same opportunities as me. Isn't it interesting that they can be anywhere in the world, really? And the last thing I'll just show you here is we like to provide lots of options. So when you come to similar cities, you can filter the similarity by population. So by default, it shows you cities with a similar population to you, but I can change that. And sure enough, Detroit's similar city makeup changes. I can look at this and say, I wanna look at cities that are slightly more aspirational than my city, um, who's similar in that regard. Of course, it changes once again for Detroit, okay? 
Um, so maybe it's best to stop here. I see we only have five minutes left, but I think this would be a great place to um, stop and see if there's any questions from the group. Uh, Shafat, if you uh, had a question. Yeah, so um, thank you so much for talking to us this afternoon and the work that you're doing is really very impressive. Thanks for working on it. Um, I'm from Pakistan and I was looking at the website to see the cities in Pakistan and I realized that uh, they aren't covered for now and I realized that that might be for the data limitations. So I'm interested to know what's your uh, future strategy to include the cities from the regions that are not included for now. Thanks. Yeah, Frank, do you want to take that one? Um, yes, well, well what we're we're hoping that um, our original database gets extended, uh, which um, actually does seem to happen. So Don and Bradsuit uh, is increasing its coverage um, over time, um, but um, uh, we cannot just wait for that. So we are also trying to figure out ways in which we could use um data sets from outside uh um uh, uh Dun Bradstreet, so to have data sets that we could merge to what we have that process is very uncertain though because harmonizing these data and collecting them in a way that's actually uh that it fits uh, in the in the in the tool will will be uh, will be tricky so i think First, we will work on figuring out whether we can actually show more in, in more cities than we do with the data that we have by looking at are more cities represented, uh, uh, well represented in the data. That's that's ongoing research. And then there is, uh, we try to, uh, to, to figure out how we could uh, uh, ingest more data, but that's longer, uh, that's some years out, I think, to, to really achieve that. <clears throat> I, did um, anyone had any more questions? I, I have one personally, but I'll let I, Rodrigo go. Yeah, I have two questions. One is, if you try to translate the industry space um, as, as a geocoded point, like uh, at, at a census track level or parcel, that's the first question. And the second is, how uh, difficult or what were the, ta the challenges of translating the HS code to Naix code, since you, you're jumping from products to industries, and if you can talk about that. Uh, yes, again, uh, the the jumping from products to industries was just sloppy use of language. I apologize for that. So Metroverse is purely industries. We don't uh, harmonize that. Um, if you want to talk about that task, uh, uh, Young has uh, worked a lot on because we did want to know how uh, how well uh, does this compare to trade data. So Young has spent quite some time on figuring that out. So uh, I, I think uh, um, uh, you 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 would definitely uh, benefit from uh, from talking to to him more. Um, sorry, I forgot your your other ah, census tract. Uh, so you you can use the census tracts in two ways uh, if. Uh, so you can, on the one hand, if you know which industries are present in which census tract, which you can, right? So you can, the geocoding is precise enough. You could look at uh, co-location at the level of census tracts uh, to figure out what are like the, what, they, what uh, uh, Richard Florida called in a paper, geographies of scope. So what are the, uh, the, the benefits of co-location on such a very small uh, spatial unit? And you can build an industry space based on that. Or you can plot each census tract in industry space, but that's going to be like uh, uh, that's that, that that's probably not that useful. But you can of course calculate the diversification potential for each census tract. To what extent this this these predictions work at this very small scale? I don't know. We we haven't tried. They work for firms themselves. They work for plants. Uh, they work for countries and they work for cities. But I never looked at within a city whether specific neighborhoods diversify in a related way as well. I wouldn't be surprised if they do. Um, why they do that? Uh, we think that a lot of this is driven actually by skills of workers. Um, so countries and cities reuse the skills that they have in different activities. Um, 
but at such a fine uh, uh, level uh, within a commuting zone, uh, there may be other uh, agglomeration economies that uh, that explain co-location. Thank you very much. It's a great tool. I have to actually jump off the line um, for another meeting, but I before I leave, I just wanted to say that you can find our contact email on Metroverse. Um, we consider this still a prototype tool, so we're super open to your ideas, your thoughts on the tool, any feedback you might have. So feel free to um, email us and, and let us know um, what you think and, and whether you're using the tool in your own work. So thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Annie. Um, thank you, yeah, thank you so much for uh, joining us, Annie. Um, if there was no further questions, I had one, and I guess I could be the last one. Um, I was actually thinking, of, uh, I developed this question, I uh, thought of this during your presentation, Frank, the SWOT analysis chart, the identifying um, admiralities. I was thinking about like adjusting this like how you could adjust this to maybe other um, variables. Um, the one that came immediately to mind was uh, climate risk. Like so you have technolo technological fit and relative presence. So if you possibly change it to, instead of technolo uh, technological fit to like risk of climate disaster or something you know, along the li lines of like measuring resilience. So you could take that into like, um, a more social social oriented resilience. I guess how have you have uh, your team thought about changing the variables um, moving forward? Uh, yeah, so that's that's actually a fantastic question. Um, I uh, we we have been talking a lot about maybe not changing the SWOT diagram itself, but adding information to it. So because. You may have opportunities in uh, in industries that do not really create good jobs. So why would you want to get those industries? Um, uh, or you may have industries that are heavily polluting, and you might actually not be that in uh, interested in. Or there are industries that are bound to decline uh, soon because they seem like very very mature, and you may not be interested in those either. Uh, but you may be interested in uh, in some some other types of industries. So you can add all kinds of industry characteristics to uh, judge whether an opportunity is actually worth taking. Uh, and that's something that we uh, want to do. Regarding um, uh, climate change, um, I, I just had a, a meeting with Young today where we uh, discussed uh, 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 that it would be a, a very interesting um, extension of the tool to actually uh, try to figure out uh, if we can use Metroverse to make predictions about uh, the direction of um, of different types of pollutants uh, uh, that the city uh, emits, and see if we can uh, help policymakers understand how different growth paths uh, impact on sustainability goals. Uh, that's research that we didn't even start, uh, but we have been talking about it uh, for quite a while, and it's definitely on the agenda. That would be uh, uh, really cool. Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and thank you to uh, Frank, Annie, and uh, Young. Young is still uh, here. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I see Young Lee is still here. Uh, so for joining us to today, you. and if anyone had any further questions, we'll probably just do it uh, post-meeting. So thanks so much uh, for joining us on this Friday Forum.